You got your compressors hooked up. I did. I heard them on. What yeah. else do you got? I Done. put my LEDs and the horns. Now we just need the tank to come in the mail. Good. What do you work on? I'm going to start working on my Mustang. What's that mean? I'm gonna, I've got it jacked up and I'm gonna take the drive line off right now. For what? I'm going to take the tranny and put the new clutch in, or attempt to. <laughs> oh, wow. that was kind of slipping. It was awful. Last season it was awful. So that's what I'm doing. My little baby's in there crying. I'll show you. Well, it's that time of year in North Dakota where you actually don't want to move from here. Birds are chirping and it starts to be mild from here on out. And the summers are just perfect really here. Come winter again, we'll start looking for another house somewhere else to move. <laughs> yeah. But we had a, a subject matter we want to talk about today. We got a comment that asked uh, how it is that we living as witnesses have so many interests and have nice stuff, uh, given the constant bombardment that witnesses receive to live a simple life. <laughs> yeah, the, the translation many witnesses take as you need to live in an apartment, you have nothing, and you reframe all the ways that you lack industriousness under, I'll do it in the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Put it off till then. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of an illustration, though, as far as uh, simplify that idea. Um, mm -hmm. uh, think of a guy that lives out in the farm, and he's got a big farm that he operates, and he's like, you know what, I'm just tired of all having to plow snow all winter and deal with these cattle and, and deal with uh, animals and deal with maybe the, the crops and, and, and uh, the seasons and whatever else. I'm going to sell all this stuff, and I'm going to move to an apartment in the city and live the a simple life where I'm closer to my doctors as I'm getting older and I'm closer to entertainment, I'm closer to restaurants, and I can be more focused on uh, doing God's will. Now you go to the opposite end and you have somebody that's living in an apartment complex and maybe they're a little bit younger and have children and they go, you know what, I'm sick of the concrete jungle, the influence that our children are have with all these uh, concrete around us and, and these people that are around here, perhaps in their neighborhood. Uh, what we want to do is we're going to go buy all this farm and, and get a tractor and we'll get some, some uh, animals and they'll learn close to nature about God and it's going to be better for them. We're going to simplify and not have all the distractions of the city so that way we can be focused on living a more godly life. So for both of them, even though they did the opposite things, their life became simplified or focused, which we'll talk about later. Maybe we can read that comment now. It's right here. I got it printed out and it says, I, we just took a portion of the, the comment out that pertains, but it says, uh, your life and lifestyle look so amazingly normal and fulfilling for a couple who was in the organization for 15 years and out for not all that long now. Your home and your choices in decor, in decor are stunning, and I'm fascinated to know how with being so young you have accumulated so much. Would you ever consider giving a little tour of your home or a history of how you came to find such an exquisite place? Also, I really admire the fact that you both seem to have hobbies, passions, and interests that you, that you allowed to develop despite what we're constantly preached to about putting kingdom interests first. That's the problem with Jehovah's Witnesses. There is no balance. Everything is all about the kingdom, and everything and everyone else is in a distant 33rd place. <laughs> 33rd place. I like that. Thank you for your comment, by the way. Yeah, and for those comments of, about us. We appreciate that. Yeah. Perhaps we can do some room-by-room room tours uh, here and there, but we want to kind of show the prudence that Hezekiah lacked. <laughs> yeah. As far as the story of how we came to North Dakota and found the house, it's a story all on its own. And it's a long story. <laughs> it is quite long. So we'll do another video on that another time. But to answer the question for now, the simple truth is that we never bought into that minimalistic idealism. There is an entire movement based on minimalism. Which there's nothing wrong with if that's your honest opinion, but in your honest choice. But. Right. But certainly not all those people that are part of that movement claim to be God-fearing. Right. Simple doesn't mean having nothing or having no worries. Or as a watchtower once stated, a simple life is not the opposite of a complex life. 
you know, that reminds me of the reality show <laughs> with, oh boy. with Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie called The Simple Life, <laughs> where they experienced uh, an ordinary life and normal jobs. And while it was hilarious and funny to watch, they in no way did the simple or focused life that Jesus talked about. Do you remember that show? Yeah, I don't remember <laughs> it, but... And I have this theory about um, the minimalist movement uh, being something promoted by the uber rich to make us feel better about being comparatively broke. <laughs> like it's a lifestyle choice rather than a necessity caused by uh, recession, unemployment, or mm -hmm. some other social factor. But uh, I digress. It's just a conspiracy theory, and I don't want to debate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we never bought into this idea that Jesus taught everyone to have nothing. For instance, the scriptures say that Jesus had a house. No, the brothers say that that was one of the disciples' houses. I'm not talking about that house. Oh. In Bible times, who took the responsibilities of the house when the father died? And, since Joseph wasn't mentioned again in Jesus' adult life, and therefore the brothers presume Joseph must have died sometime earlier, who would take up the responsibility of the man of the house? The oldest one. And who would that have been? Jesus, at the time, yeah. And as the prodigal son illustrates, or Isaac and several other patriarchs, no. did the parents have to be dead to pass that on to their children? Not necessarily. Well then, at least with the rights of the firstborn, Jesus had a house. Okay, but some may say Jesus said to give to the poor and have treasure in heaven. Also, Zacchaeus gave away half of his belongings to gain salvation. And Jesus said one cannot serve God and riches. All true, all true. But the Bible tells the whole tale. So let's look at some of those scriptures in context. Okay. So the first scripture we mentioned is Matthew 19, 16 through 24. And I'm going to read that. It says, Now look, a certain one came up to him and said, Teacher, what good must I do in order to get everlasting life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? One, there is that is good. If, though, you want to enter into life, observe the commandments continually. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, Why, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What yet am I lacking? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come be my follower. When the young man heard this saying, he went away grieved, for he was holding many possessions. But Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you that it will be difficult for a difficult thing for a rich man to get into the kingdom of the heavens. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to get through a needle's eye than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. So there we see it says, come be my follower in verse 21. Now, that's an interesting quote because it, that wasn't open to everybody. For example, flip over to Mark 5 and verse 18 and 19. Now, as he was boarding the boat, the man that had been demon-possessed began entreating him that he might continue with him. However, he did not let him, but said to him, Go home to your relatives and report to them all the things Jehovah has done for you and the mercy he had on you. So here we see this man wanted to go with Jesus, and Jesus said, No, 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 you go home and preach to your relatives. So when we go back to Matthew with this account with the rich man, it seems as though this rich man was offered a special opportunity, along with the apostles, to be a direct follower in intimate association. The previous verses talked about what did he need to do to gain life. Well, he'd acknowledged that he was doing those things, so he'd already been worthy of life. But here, this special opportunity that was extended to him, and he had a problem in order to accept that, which was his money. And you think about that. It, Jesus said, I have nowhere to lay my head. And for three and a half years of his ministry, he didn't. They traveled around nonstop. So being attached to those possessions and that money that he had at that time, it would have been a contrast to being an apostle. So now let's move on to Zacchaeus. And again, the context is important. And where's that one? I know it's in Luke, Tiff. You probably have a better idea yeah. of the verses than me. It's uh, Luke 19. Okay. 
And it starts out in verse 1, and he entered Jericho and was going through. Now there was a man called by the name Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So the account says that Zacchaeus was rich. But notice how he got some of those riches in verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, the half of my belongings, Lord, I'm giving to the poor, and whatever I extorted from anyone by false accusation, I am restoring fourfold. So Zacchaeus defrauded, and he was a much-hated, crooked tax collector. But this statement that he was rich, if he returned four times what he defrauded and gave half of what was left to the poor, do you imagine that he became poor? Personally, I doubt it. The rich know how to compound their money, if nothing else. If he defrauded a hundred bucks, he probably turned it into a thousand pretty easily. So giving back four hundred would still leave him six hundred bucks in profit. Of course, this is all just speculation. I don't think there's any actual way to ascertain how much Zacchaeus had as far as uh, today's money values. Mm-hmm. But just to, let's just imagine being rich. He had $100 million. I think we can all agree that $100 million is rich. Right. And going along with that little scenario we drew out, let's say he returned what he defrauded at $20 million and then gave half of what was left at $40 million, leaving him with $40 million. Would you call him poor then? I doubt it. Well, let's say that's too much of a money. And I think we can agree that uh, a million isn't rich anymore. Uh, now it's a lot of money, and I, I don't have that much money. But the reality is, is that a lot of people don't necessarily consider that rich. So let's call it $10 million. I think we can agree that is rich. So that would leave him with $4 million left. Would you call him poor? Uh, I would know I wouldn't. Mm-mm. So the last scripture that you brought out, Matthew six twenty four. And again, just as the other two, the context is important. No one can slave for two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stick to the one and despise the other. You cannot slave for God and for riches. So there's the statement. You can't slave for God and for riches. But let's drop back two verses in verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If then your eye is simple, your whole body will be bright. So, simple versus focused. And this is interesting because simple is not in the silver bullet, the new New World Translation, at all. They've changed that, and they've changed it to focused. Tiffany, would you read that quick? It's interesting to say, though, that if you go to the New World Translation in the Reference Bible, it does say focused in the footnote. So basically, they've pulled focused and put it in the text and relegated simple to the footnote. So the New New World Translation. The lamp of the body is the eye. If then your eye is focused, your whole body will be bright. So there we have it. Focused versus simple. Now, why did they do that? Is there something that's uh, amiss with the general idea that witnesses have that they kind of like to correct? It doesn't seem to stop them from propagating the idea of having nothing, but there's definitely a meaning change there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tiffany kind of has an illustration about this that she got from a photographer. Do you know what I'm talking about with the picture? Yeah, I do. It's not my illustration. It's the guy I worked with, the photographer I worked with. It's his illustration, but... Um, He once said, like, in a picture, in a photograph, with all those pixels, only one pixel is actually in focus. Um, But if we take a step further to get the true impact of the illustration, if you take away one pixel from the center of the picture, it's obvious that the focal point is missing. A black dot in there. Yeah, anyone can have a beautiful life. God gives good gifts even to the unrighteous, right along with the righteous. But without that focal point, many see the focal point is missing, like Chad said, that little black dot. But now if you put that one pixel back and we can see the complete beautiful picture with the focal point beautifying the rest of the picture by bringing it all in harmony. Right. But now let's reverse the illustration. This time, leave the center pixel in and take away all the rest. All you have now is one little pixel in the screen. Sure, it's in perfect focus, but how does it pertain to the rest of the picture? You don't have a picture. What's the point of the focal point? 
There isn't one. If you eliminate all of the picture that the focal point is supposed to beautify, the focal point has lost its use. You can't even tell what the picture is supposed to be. Uh, keeping the future kingdom in focus and living by its principles beautifies the rest of your life. And the reverse is true. If you live by kingdom principles, you bring attention to the focal point of your life, that future kingdom. But if you live as a stoic, there's nothing to bring glory to the kingdom. It reminds me of one of the most paradoxical presidential quotes I can think of. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Now, I get it. We don't want to be self-serving. But the job of a government or a country is to serve the people. If the government doesn't serve the people, then the government has lost its use. As Jesus said, the law came in existence for the sake of man, not man for the sake of the law. Uh, that's one of the main problems that Watchtower forgets. It's not about them. It's about the people. Uh, and Jesus understood this. So how about some biblical examples of rich people who had it in balance? Okay, fair enough. How about Abraham? Abraham had a whole bunch of stuff, lots of stuff, and we, we, can, re we can read about Abraham and all the stuff that he brought when he left Ur. <laughs> and how much God blessed him even furthermore when he got yeah. to where he was going. Yep. Uh, how about Job? Job was very wealthy and had it all taken away from him, and then at the end, he was blessed with double. Yeah, the richest of the Orientals, I think it says. How about the golden example, shining example, if you ask me, Solomon? Yeah, Solomon. I think it says about him that he was the the richest man that had lived ever lived at the time. Probably, probably rivals some of the ones yeah. that have lived today. Today, yeah. If yeah. you were to transfer that over, these were all God fearing people. Yeah, but that was in the Hebrew Scriptures. Yeah, fair enough. How about uh, Joseph of Arimathea? He was rich, mm -hmm. and he uh, purchased Jesus too. That's true. Uh, how about Lydia, seller of purple? Mm -hmm. That's the color of royalty. Do you think if uh, you had Trump as a client, you'd be doing pretty well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, a matter of fact, is the scriptures say that they had a meeting in her house, early meetings, Christian meetings. Mm -hmm. Same with uh, uh, Mary, the mother of uh, John, Mark. They also had meetings in, in their house, and they had servants that answered when Peter ran away. Yeah. Or uh, my favorite in the uh, Greek scriptures, how about Cornelius? Mm -hmm. A centurion. What did that mean? Century means 100, so Imagine. it was over 100 men. Yeah, so the boss of 100. Even the Bearing Thorough Witness book depicts the disciples in awe as they enter his house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's on page 75 in this book, this one. I can show you this picture. Okay. Yeah. And how about the Watchtower Society's buildings? Yeah. What is the, some of the buildings they've got? What is that theater downtown? The Stanley the Theater. The Stanley Theater, which is beautiful. Yeah. Or uh, how about some of the buildings that they've got, the, the apartment complexes? I mean, how much does it cost to have a flat in downtown New York City right there? I mean, I, I know it's one of the most expensive places to live, but I've got no idea how much that would cost. And then you go into some of those apartment complexes that the brothers had, and there's nice fancy chandeliers in there, and they're historic buildings, and, and they're, they're beautiful, which I personally don't have a problem with, mm -hmm. but I've got a problem with the hypocrisy. Yeah, I do too. I kind of have a little bit of, of a beef with this, because it kind of reminds me, eh, it just kind of reminds me of Catholicism. You know, they want their headquarters to look beautiful on the outside, while everybody else is told to live in poverty. You know, you give us all your money, forget about you, and you just work for us. Right. So we never bought into that. Contrary to a minimalist, stoic view, we view the Bible as practical guidance when it comes to finances. Mm -hmm. Just to glaze over some examples. Instead of instant gratification, endurance is needed to see something through to completion. Laziness leads one to poverty. Buying with loans makes you a slave to the lender. More bricks. <laughs> so stay away from getting into debt. Don't live beyond your means. Do as much as you can for yourself. Don't spend frivolously. Don't waste. And with that, being generous pays you back. So we could go on and on with the practical financial advice the Bible shares. But when these principles are carried out, 
as Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says, everything he does will succeed. Yeah. As for us, we don't eat out much. We usually eat out only when we're away on work. Which is usually half a tax write-off. <laughs> yeah, we haven't seen a movie in years. Nor do we do video games. Our entertainment comes from seeing the results of uh, working on a project. We rarely buy new, and when we do buy new, it is usually on clearance, and we maximize those opportunities. I mean, we bought entire truckloads from stores closing down. Yeah. I think one time we went back with three times with a truck and trailer when this one store was closing down. Mm -hmm. And we even stock up on cheese when it's clearanced out. Moldy cheese is good. You just cut off the edge. No, it's gross. <laughs> But we try to eat healthy, um, which not only saves on food, but it also helps with medical costs. Self-employment allows us to take advantage of opportunities we wouldn't normally have, like garage sales, auctions, or even chasing down a good deal on Craigslist. I like to say we're kind of bottom feeders. I once wrote a thesis, uh, Reverse of Philosophy was the name, and uh, it was how to do the opposite, basically, that everybody else is doing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So instead of writing a check, we just roll up our sleeves. We repurpose what was tossed because it was broken. Yep, we glean what others dismiss as valueless. We restore what others have used up. We use the skills we acquire to help other people. And we share the value of finding one man's junk <laughs> with those who treasure it. And we've experienced the general truism of Matthew 13, 12, that many people just want to support what we do in keeping yesterday in the present. So that practical value of the scriptures sort of explains the general mentality we have, which has led us to where we are today. Some may say, I don't even believe in God, and yet I live by those principles. And we say, good for you. <laughs> you are by nature demonstrating how biblical principles benefit us, but not all people know how to live such a life. And wouldn't it be nice to benefit them too? Good point. Sharing those beneficial principles is one of the main points of Christianity. And when you live a life based on the biblical principles of the future kingdom government, well, the benefits you enjoy right now give witness to that kingdom and how that future government is going to benefit all of mankind. So hopefully that answers your question as far as that comment goes. And we appreciate your comment, by the way. We appreciate all your comments. Absolutely. Um, and, and even though some of the comments, you know, we don't agree with everyone, and you don't agree with everyone either, but that's okay. We can still have a discussion. So um, we just really appreciate all your support and your nice things that you say. And um, we hit 1,000 subscribers, which is so great. Um, we, we do have three or four videos kind of in the works of what we're going to talk about next. But if you have something specifically, a subject matter that you want us to talk about, um, leave it in the comments or send us a message through our email, which is unassignedvlog at gmail.com. I'll try to remember to stick it in the description box. And if it's longer and a deeper conversation or if you want to remain anonymous, uh, a lot of times I'll yeah. get individuals that uh, we really like to hear from individuals that are studying and individuals yeah. that are witnesses. Not that we don't uh, like to hear from others as well. Uh, yeah. But that's kind of an interesting facet because uh, so many times we think that uh, we as being deemed apostates or, or kicked out, have, have, we're all alone. That's what they want you to think. You're all by yourself. Mm -hmm. And I knew from experience talking to witnesses that are active while I, we were, we were active that, no, we're not alone. And that's another thing they want to tell you. Uh, nobody else feels that way. And the fact of the matter is, no, most of the people feel that way. Mm -hmm. Hierarchy doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. And so that encourages that when we hear those comments. So if you want to remain anonymous, you can use that email that Tiffany mentioned, yeah. and uh, uh, we can still encourage each other that way. So we appreciate that very much. Yeah, just it made me just think of when he said that there there is an obvious um, division line between the hierarchy and non-hierarchy, and maybe we could do a video about that. Yeah. So... So again, we want to thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next video. So subscribe, like, leave us a comment. Share. Share. Sharing is caring. <laughs>
bug she's very unhappy so what I'm working on is I've got this up I've got a light I'm going to take the drive line off wherever it is right there I if I remember right there's seven sixteenths it shouldn't take me very long I'll just crawl around there and get it off and then I'll jack the front up and We'll take that tr little tiny baby tranny out. <laughs> so I'm under my Mustang, and it's 7 sixteenths. Just pulled the U-joint off. I mean the drive line where the U-joint is right here. I just pulled it off of this. Didn't take too long, maybe like, I don't know, seven minutes, eight minutes. And now I'm going to, um, I don't want to pull that out. But I need to pull the drive line out of the tranny, and I'm gonna drop the jack and jack the front up so I can pull the tranny bolts out. Okay, so I have my car up on jacks, and um, it's already six o'clock. I just started this kind of real late because I was doing a bunch of other junk today. So tomorrow, when I come down here. I will pull the tranny bolts and this is April this is the time of year we usually work on this thing anyway so we'll do a tune-up and um, fix the clutch clean it up just get it ready for the season so I can ensure it and get it ready for this summer <laughs> so, I'm excited You about done or what? Well, I dropped the tranny because it's a little heavy for you, but I don't want to fall around. Get the clutch off. I do have the clutch. I hate this. So this was cobbled together from before because we couldn't find a clutch and we dropped the springs, so I had welded the springs back in it, as you can see. And this is previously, and now it's got a split in it again. So it's uh, due for the new clutch. The new clutch. And it was still working. Is the clutch right there? Yeah, it's above you, if you wanna grab that. Bring it over here. Watch it'll be different. It looks like it. Let me see. Bring it here. I hope not. It does look different. As long as it ain't bigger. And it is. Son of a biscuit eater. Damn it. <laughs> so then I don't know what to do because. I don't know. It depends on whether or not it fits in there still. It may fit in there still. An extra quarter inch of. A half inch of plate ain't gonna be a, a disc ain't gonna be a big deal if they get extra. There's the plate. It's over. Shifter. Yeah, we're gonna have to order something else. That sucks. I thought the guy said he was supposed to fit a Mustang, a six cylinder. I guess we just gotta rip the thing out and put a V8 in it. <laughs> I've been saying that for years. No, but we won't get gas mileage like we do. Yeah. We get super good gas mileage with this car. Just like, I want to say, like, on a nice day, we get near 30. Yeah. If the wind's blowing right, you know, we get near 30. That makes me upset. Yeah, that sucks. There's no numbers on this, is there? Not anymore, probably. I don't know where they'd be anyway, but... I don't know where to get one, honestly. Unless I go... Unless I go talk to Daryl down there you know he's pretty knowledgeable 
I mean, I can re-drill this and put this in, but it was already slipping, which yeah. means the clutch is probably Getting thin. thin. Let me see it. Put them back to back. Maybe we can mic it to make sure. I might just take it down there to Daryl and just see if he can... It doesn't look that different, I don't think. It's just the wrong size. It's pretty greasy too, so heck, that could be half the problem. That's why it was slipping. That crack though. That's yeah, I can re-drill that right next to it. And then maybe re-rivet another. Let me just go down to Daryl's and yeah. see. I'll All do right. that tomorrow. Because it's almost like, what, seven now? You can check eBay too. Okay. I'm happy to have it done. Are you happy to have the clutch done? Okay. Show me your hands. Nice. No, not nice. I hate driving. I hate touching anything when it's like this. Look at there's a rainbow over there. So the video that I took of when we got the clutch done got corrupted, so I'm just going to do a quick follow-up. But um, we we did order a, a new clutch off of eBay so it would be the right size. Um, so we did bring it home and it's parked here. Um, test drove it. It works great. So all is good. This is my little Tiffany box color is like Tiffany blue and then Chad airbrushed a little bow on the back for me so it is my little Tiffany box I just love it I need to get a Tiffany box to put in the car I think that'd be super cute and then my white walls we actually did those white walls and we usually have to do them every year so they still look decent right now but I just have to wash it and then it will be ready to go for the season. I checked all the fluids, it's all good.